My heart was broke, my head was sore, what a feeling Tied up in ancient history I didn't believe in destiny I turned around, was standing, feeling What a feeling in my soul Love burns brighter than sunshine Brighter than sunshine Let the rain fall, I don't care Blow yours and suddenly you're mine And it's brighter than sunshine I never saw it happening I'm giving up and giving in and Take the hurt again, what a feeling I didn't have the strength to fight But suddenly you seem so right You and me, what a feeling So Good morning. Welcome to Field Middle School. You're Jacob as well this morning. It is a pleasure to be here with you. Um, we're probably going to have some people coming in, so people who don't uh, see chairs or who are, look like they're floundering, just kind of wave them over and, uh, and, and seat them, I guess. We uh, take out your, uh, your bulletins, your, your Sunday papers, and inside of that you have your communication card. Fill that out. It's a way for you to communicate with us and for us to know what's going on with you. If you have prayer requests or anything like that, please make them known. This is your opportunity to, to allow us uh, kind of uh, a window into your life. If you need some help or for whatever reasons, if you have a, a request or a comment or a concern, that's all fair game uh, for the communication card. We're kind of starting a new and crazy venture here uh, for Jacob as well, for us. And it's, it's small groups. It's, it's groups at Jacob's Well. How many of you have ever been a part of a smaller group of any kind? Whether it be a class or uh, something of more religious content? Many of you. 
So you understand when I say small group, I'm not talking like a like a, an aid group or or something like that. This isn't um, this isn't something that is is unimportant. This is a very important thing for us as a community. And so we're going to watch a video here. We're going to watch a video for the adults, and we're going to watch also we have uh, a video for the kids, and we're starting small groups for the kids here at Jacob's Well. And we just want you to be aware of what's going on. Jacob's Well for a couple of months now. And I must admit, crowds on Sunday mornings can be intimidating, and it's not always easy to get to know people either before or after service. That's why I'm looking forward to the groups being formed here at Jacob's Well. What are groups at Jacob's Well? It's an opportunity for you to develop friendships, to get to know more people in the community, but most importantly, it's an opportunity to develop your faith and grow in your love for God. So we look forward to you joining us here in groups at Jacob's Well. Groups, we'll share a meal and get to know the people around us without any distractions, just eating and talking. We'll pray together and for each other to break out of that rut of only having a private or a personal relationship with God. We'll share our stories because everyone has a unique way that they come to Jacob's Well. Our stories show us how varied and active God is in our lives. In our groups, we'll watch a DVD, come with questions, and explore them with others. We'll lean on each other's experiences to understand our own walk with God. Together in our groups, we'll get to experience what it's like to serve others and realize that we have more time to help people in need when we make it a priority together. Okay, so each group at Jacob's Well eats, prays, studies, serves, and shares together, all in an effort to strengthen our love for God and for each other. So what exactly are the groups at Jacob's Well? The groups of 8 to 10 people that will meet once a week from April 18th to May 30th. The groups will meet in the home to eat, share, pray, and discuss. The groups can be co-ed, same gender, or couples, and meet any day of the week. And then at the end of the session, everyone will decide whether to stay in the group or join a group. So, how can you get started in a group? We would like to invite you to join a group starting on April 18th. On April 18th, the group link event will kick off groups at Jacob's Well. Group link is for adults, teens, and kids through third through fifth grade. So during a group link, you'll connect with the group, get to know each other, receive your group DVD, decide when and where to gather over the next five weeks, and you get to worship with the Jacob's Well Band. On May 30th, all the groups will reunite for the big celebration event. So if you haven't signed up yet, fill out your registration card located in your Sunday paper and bring it on out to the groups at the Jacob's Well table in the cafe after the service. There, you can also purchase your event ticket. So we really hope to see you on April 18th from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock p.m. at Group Week.
we're going on a road trip. Road trips are awesome. Together on the open road. Together with friends. And making new ones too. Seeing all kinds of cool stuff. Sharing stories. Eating all kinds of junk food. <laughs> oh yeah. That too. Anyway, road trips are a lot of fun. And we're here to invite third to fifth graders to come along on an amazing road trip. We're going to be exploring our faith and discovering how cool it is to hang out with some friends. Third to fifth graders are invited to come along. We will be starting on April 18th. That's Wednesday evenings. They will meet at the community center with about eight other kids of same age and the road trip leader. At the end, we'll gather for a celebration with all the other groups. Sounds great, huh? Hey, Ingrid, it's your turn. Can you tell the kids about the groups and about Group Link? <laughs> um, I guess we'll tell you. Here's what you should do if you want to come along on the road trip. Figure out if you're in third to fifth grade. That one should be easy. Then, check with your parents. See if they think the idea is cool, too. And check your calendars. It's important that you have Wednesday nights free in April and May. You might even know a friend you want to invite to come along with you on the road trip. Then send an email to me, Heidi at Jacobswell.net, or call the office, 612-822-0300. Come to the group e link event on April 18th from 7 to 9 p.m. There you'll get to meet the other kids in your group and your trusty road trip guide. And we'll take the first leg of our journey that night. Awesome! Can I come too? <laughs> uh, I had nothing to do with that. Uh, where is Ingrid even in here? I don't think she is. That's probably great. Uh, yes. So if you missed that, group link is this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock uh, at Bethel Evangelical Free Church in their kind of uh, off the main space gym area uh, down on, I believe it's 17th Avenue and 42nd Street. This Wednesday, 7 a.m., come. If you're, if you're kind of skeptical about groups, you don't really know what they are, uh, give it a shot, see what happens. Um, the sign-up sheets are at the table out in the front area. So, if you'd like to sign up, please do. We'd love to have you. All right, let's stand together and let's worship the Lord this morning. Kindness wakens me, wakens me from my sleep. Your love, it beckons deeply, a call to come and die. By grace now I will come and take this life, take your life. Sin has lost its power. Death has lost its sting From the grave you've risen Victoriously Into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness, out of shame By the cross you are the truth You are the life, you are the Sin is lost. 
sin has lost its power Death has lost its sting From the grave present Victoriously It's a marvelous light Out of shame By the cross You are the truth You are the life You are the way Sing that Into marvelous light I'm running Out of darkness Out of shame By the cross You are the truth You are the life You are the way You may be seated. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Those are really good questions. And I have to admit, I don't have the answers. And anyone who claims that they do is most likely lying. But we're not here this morning to answer those questions, even though we may be asking them. Those are all very valid questions. We're here this morning to figure out how in community, being together, we can point our lives towards something that's greater than all of those problems. That in spite of those problems and in spite of those doubts, in spite of those questions that we all have, there's one constant that still remains. That's what we're here to find out this morning. Not to answer any questions, but to figure out what are the right questions that we can ask. Yeah. 
step down into darkness Open my eyes, let me see Beauty that made this heart adore you Hope of a life spent with you Here I am to worship Here I am to bow down Here I am to say that You're my God You're all together lovely All together worthy All together wonderful to me King of all days, oh so highly exalted Glorious in heaven above Created all for love's sake, became poor. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're
hope of the nations Jesus, a comfort for all who mourn You are the source of heaven's hope on earth Jesus, light in the darkness Jesus, truth in the circumstance You are the source of heaven's light on earth In history, you lived and died You broke the chains, you rose to life You are the Comfort for all who mourn You are the source of heaven's hope on earth Jesus, light in the darkness Jesus, truth in circumstance We don't know what to believe sometimes. There's so many things out there. But God, you said that you're the light. And maybe we've seen a glimpse, but we don't really know. 
We just ask for you to guide us here today. Just be with us. Set the stage for our hearts to be changed. We thank you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome everybody. It's uh, fantastic that you're here and you are Jacob's Well today. And we are doing something a little different um, through this whole worship series. And we are looking at really creating a six-week conversation. And that means we need your help in it. And uh, we'll get to that part. And what I really want to do is explain how you, what your part is going to be. Okay? And we're talking about I am you are. I am. Jesus said, I am. A whole lot of things. He said, I'm a lot of different things. So we're going to try to figure out what that's all about. But he also said, then, therefore, you are certain things. And so, how do we figure this out? What does it mean to follow Christ? Who is he? Who did he say, I am? And who does he say, you are? So we're going to do it. And your part is, uh, I'm going to do some introductory remarks. And then we have a guest I'll introduce in a little bit. And he's going to be talking with us. And I think it's going to make you... I mean, there's some questions you're going to have, okay? There's no such thing as a dumb question. There's no such thing as a bad question. They're just questions. And um, so this is how you can ask your questions, okay? You can, one, there are pieces of paper on your, on your chair. You can just write your question on there. And there'll be some people in the aisles who can hand them to you. They'll go back to the back, and they'll pop up on the screen um, a little bit later when we get to the question response time. You can also, if, you, if you're really hip, you can text message, Okay. So there's going to be a phone number on the screen, and if you want to write it down right now, it's 612-437-1321. It'll be on the screen later, but that's uh, 612-437-1321. So if you are really cool, if you don't know how to use, if you've got a phone that text messages and you don't know how, this is a good time to learn. While I'm talking, you can practice, all right, because I'm not saying anything all that important. Um, but just find the menu, and then you'll find messaging, and then under that there'll be a text messaging, and then you pop in the phone number, and then you uh, just do the message. You know how it works? Like the B key says A, or the two key says A, B, C. If you push it once, you'll get an A. If you push it twice, you'll get a B. Push it three times, you'll get a C. And you don't have to worry about spelling right. They'll correct your spelling before it goes on the, on the screen, all right? If you don't know how to you know, backspace, don't worry about it. Just pluck it out and... Uh, Text message that up to there, and it'll come up on the screen for us. So it's a great anonymous way to ask the question you've always been wanting to ask. If it's really a bad question, well, just pretend it didn't happen. Um, Okay, hey, I want to just spend a minute giving us some perspective, because one of the first things that Jesus says is, I am the light of the world. And that is an audacious, uh, you know, uh, what, claim in our world, because there is a lot of darkness out in the world. I mean, half of the world right there in that picture is in the darkness right now. You know, what does that mean? Light and dark has been used as a metaphor forever by all kinds of people. And I thought light and dark was pretty simple. I had a handle on it for years. And then I read the Bible more carefully, and I realized Jesus goes deeper than even that. Um, So I had to actually do some study to figure out a little bit about this. But one of the, the first thing we learn is that God likes light. God likes light. And we find that in the very first verses of the Bible, talk about how, G, how God created the universe. How God created the universe. It's not meant to be understood scientifically um, you know, or even as real history. It's telling us what was God all about. And the first act of creation is this verse here. And you can read that. It's the top of your um, outline. Read that with me. God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and separated the light from the darkness. That's on the back of your uh, Sunday paper, by the way. There's a message outline that you can follow along with. And um, God separates. See, God wants light in our world. And God looked at a world of darkness, and God, this is God's job, separate light from dark. Because God knows that darkness is a bad, it's a hard place for us to be. It's a hard place for us to be. So God wants to separate light from darkness. But the fact is, we have darkness in our lives and it's just a, you know a lie to pretend that we don't we do have darkness in our life now this is the, the big step here and i'm running through this all really really quickly but when jesus came into our world what he is saying by saying i am the light of the world is that he's saying that because of him because of jesus light over darkness is a done deal light will win light wins over darkness now, it may seem like a little bit of a naive comment. I mean, 
You know, we find it right away when uh, John, in his gospel, when he writes about the life of Jesus and who Jesus was, the very first thing he says about Jesus, he refers to him as light, and he says, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has never put it out. The darkness has never put it out. Two weeks ago, we met here and we looked at the death of Jesus and his crucifixion. And one of the things that we noticed was the last thing he said before he died is, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his life. In fact, that word finished would probably be better translated as it is completed or it is fulfilled. What, and what is it? What is fulfilled? What is completed? It is a battle between light and dark. That's what is completed. That is what is fulfilled. Um, because of Jesus, light over darkness is a done deal. Now, that may not be how you see it. may not be what you think, what you believe. I'm just telling you, this is the biblical perspective. This is what Jesus is trying to help us understand, and we're going to be unpacking here a little bit today. Um, now, a lot of people get hung up right there and say, well, the, Jesus said, I'm the light, and that you know, light has won over darkness, but I look around the world, and that proves to me that God doesn't exist. And that's what, not what the Bible's trying to claim. The Bible doesn't say the darkness is all gone yet. No, in fact, what the Bible claims, what I have experienced in my life, is that this is where I find God. When I go to my darkness, when I go to meet another person in their darkness, that's where I find God. That's the front lines. That's where God is very, very present, helping light win over darkness one more time. That brings us to the next point, is these five very important components about understanding Jesus as the light of the world. And the third one is that living fully in God's light is part of the future. It's part of the future. This is something that we live in now, we believe now, but it isn't a reality right now, is it? I mean, there's darkness all around us. People's lives, your lives, my life has lots of elements of darkness. This is something in the future. Our, our faith in it is not something that we experience now so much. It's something that we are looking forward to. It is like uh, an inheritance that we know that belongs to us, but we have not yet received it fully. Um, this is a, a wonderful verse. If you want to read these along with me from 1 Corinthians 13, from the Message Translation. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing God directly, just as God knows us. Living fully in God's light is part of the future. And that means that we live in hope. I mean, if, if hope is something that we already know, it's a certainty in our past, that's not hope anymore. That's just plain knowledge. We live in hope because we live, um, uh, we live because of something that awaits us in the future. And this is the audaciousness of following Christ. That we would not only believe with our heads something that we can't always see with our eyes, but we would trust it with our hearts and we would actually live it out in our actions. We would actually live ways that we cannot verify with what we can point at in the world around us. Because God has given us the conviction that is true, not the certainty. Let's look at this Bible verse from Hebrews 11. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Last week we talked about the difference between certainty and conviction. God gives us conviction even when we do not have certainty of this hope, this light that always wins over darkness. Um, and that brings us to the last component of what this means. See, God, or Jesus, didn't only say, I am the light of the world. Jesus also said, who is the light of the world? He said, you are the light of the world. Each and every one of us are the light of the world of the world. We have a quote from Jesus here. I invite you to read this with me. You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I am, you are. What, God, what Christ is, we also are. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. We are Christ's presence in the world today. And there are lots of ways of being that kind of light. Um, that light is sometimes a candle, which is exactly what we need. Other times, it's something a little more drastic. You know? And, um, and God needs us to be these kinds of light. And I, what I want to do is introduce to you a man who's very much like this. <laughs> Sorry, he won't be able to see you now. He's blinded him. <laughs> Mike, Mark Peter Lundquist. You want to come on up here? Mark Peter Lundquist is a man who's been working with Urban Ventures um, uh, 
an organization that decided in 1993 to shine the light of God's love into a very, well, one of the dark places in our city, the uh, Phillips Central neighborhood around Lake Street. And uh, they went there, and if I were them, I would have given up a long time ago. And they have stuck it out, and some amazing stuff has happened. Uh, Mark Peter is one of these things. And I've known him for some time, but I've gotten to know him more just recently. And um, when I've talked to him, I have learned so much. I have learned that the darkness is a lot darker than I thought it was. I mean, this is the sort of stuff I would rather not know about sometimes. But I've also found that the light can have a lot more effect than I ever thought it could. Um, thanks for being here, first of all, Mark. Peter. Good to be and, here. Yeah, good. And my, you know, my first question for you is simply, you know, what, what drew you to the neighborhood? What is the darkness? What's going on there? And uh, you know, why did you go to Lake Street? Um, you know, when we talk about this kind of stuff, maybe it's, it's sometimes when you talk about the dark, it seems really dark. And I don't mean to use the dark as a way to, I don't know, create um, sympathy or empathy or something like that. It's reality. Uh, what we did is um, when we chose that area on, on, just off of 4th Avenue and Lake Street, the whole block was empty. Um, every single uh, building was boarded up. No one lived there. It was known as Crack Avenue. There's more crack cocaine sold on that street uh, than any place in the upper Midwest. So we purposely chose to go there and for a lot of other good reasons too. Maybe bad reasons, I guess you know, you'd really say. Uh, the poverty rate, about $12,000 is the uh, annual income, per capita income for the central neighborhood, 11500 for the Phillips neighborhood. Um, the, uh, the graduation rate, you know, there's about um, uh, 72,000 12th graders last year in Minneapolis Public Schools, and of that, 36,000 did not graduate from, from high school. So we know that there was, there was you know, a lot of... I guess we'd call it academic poverty. There was um, a lot of violence, still is. Um, there's a, there's, besides the poverty, what we do is we gauge poverty in terms of how many kids are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So to give you an example of that, Anderson School, which is in our neighborhoods, 97% of the kids at that school get a free or reduced lunch. Okay, And you compare that with uh, Edina, it's 8%. Or Minnetonka, 4%. So, you know, we kind of bring these things together and that was our reason to go there. We wanted to go into a place where we could make a difference. And um, we've made a difference, but there's a lot of work to be done. I had a, a kid in my car this week and we were talking and um, we are building a high school, a Jesuit high school, that's going to be open this September. And uh, if you make too much money, then you cannot go there. It's uh, for a family of four, you have to make under $34,000 a year. And so we were talking, and his name is Kiwan, and I said, um, so where are you going to be going to high school? He said, well, I'd love to go to Cristo Rey. That's the name of the high school. I said, why? And he said, because I want to feel safe. And I said, well, why don't you feel safe? He says, because of all the gangbangers at school, all the violence at school, I just would love to go to a place one day where I could just learn. So those are some of the reasons of why we went to where we, we are and why we do the things we do. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're, you know, again, and the, the, when we talk about people that are in darkness, that's something that covers all of our lives. It's uh, not exclusive to a neighborhood or a group of people or anything. Um, but there's some people that are really having difficulty with it. I know you told me a statistic of uh, some kids, eighth graders or something, and asked what they wanted to be when they grew up. And when we did a survey, we asked all of our eighth grade kids that we work with, what do you want to be when you grow up? we got a number of replies that said, I want to live to be 21. We never kind of expected that. We thought of firemen, a policemen, but they want to survive. So, so what, do you, what do you do? I mean, this sounds tough. I mean, you know, kind of place I'd want to avoid, but you decided to go there. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, there's a Bible verse that I change around um, that is, um, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of adolescence. And uh, we all kind of know that, you know, what we have. And the only way you can really make a change in a kid's life is you love them into changing. And love them into changing is not a sentiment, it's not a feeling, because a sentiment or a feeling doesn't change anybody. It's an action. Love is a concrete action that means you've got to be involved in a kid's life. 
And I think that when you do that, you actually start to become the answer to your prayer. You are your prayer's answer. We don't just sit around and say, God, do this, do that, change this person's life, change this community. You know what? You're the answer to your own prayer. So that's why we, that's how we do it. We have a, a saying here at Jacob's Well that we you know, hear pretty often. That is, we pray for miracles and God sends people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, quite often, you're the people God sent. <laughs> yeah. So... So how do you go about this? I mean, this is obviously an enormous job. And, um, you know, it's not a matter of just giving some handouts or, uh, you know, the soup kitchens, the uh, places for people to, homeless people to sleep are really important. But obviously those aren't answers. Those are, wh- what do you do? And how do you uh, start tackling this problem? We developed a theory of change. If you kind of think about your own life, you know, how have you made changes? How have, how have you, what has been about your life? where it's brought you to go from this to that. And our theory of change involves four H's. Um, it's not science, but I think it's good community work. Uh, the first thing is heart. Uh, everything begins with a transformation of your heart. A kid needs a moral compass. We all need a moral compass. There's got to be a regeneration. There's got to be a change there. So that's what we go after. The second thing we do is we go after head. It's one thing to have... Um, there's a lot of people on Lake Street, Chicago... They know a lot of Bible verses, but they've never, and they're using, or they're selling themselves, but uh, they've never graduated from high school. So you, you have to include the head. You have to get them graduated from high school. So it's heart, head. The third H we deal with is hurt. We have a lot of kids that have seen a lot of things they shouldn't have seen. A lot of things that have happened to them that they have not invited to happen to them. We have kids that have their mothers bring home Johns to their house, We've had girls that have seen their mother shot on their living room floor. We've seen, have kids have seen their father shot on the, on the, uh, the curb. We have some of our refugee kids who have seen um, family members have their limbs chopped off in refugee camps. So how do you make it? Hurt really impedes you to the next step. You can't be thinking about uh, Benjamin Franklin or the Constitution if you've got all this hurt you know, going through your head. So we try to try to uh, heal the hurt. And the last thing is hands. And that is we want to have a person, a kid, to actually give back. We don't want them to be in a perpetual state of receiving, but the goal is to see them one day giving back. That's our theory of change. I think it works. That's pretty uh, amazing. Just you know, quickly, too, you uh, talk about the different levels that you work with society, <laughs> with the individual and the family. Can you just tell us a little bit about that and then so the social change? individual um, family, the different units or levels of units that you work with? Just like practically what yeah. we actually do? Well, we, you know, our big thing is uh, kids, families, and economic development. So um, with people development, um, we do Urban Stars, which is a lot of athletic programming. We do Learning Lab, which is a lot of after-school academic programming. We have a thing called the Urban Hub, which is a recording studio and skateboard area, our mentoring program. Families, we do uh, parenting classes for about 2,000. Parents, we have a group called Mad Dads. I don't know if anyone of you seen Mad Dads doing street patrol. We actually send them out four nights a week. Uh, they're all ex-gangbangers, and they recruit these parents right off the streets, put them into parenting programs. People's Exchange, which is food, clothing, furniture, emergency assistance. Go Latino, which is uh, working all with our Hispanic population. And then we've uh, started about 10 new businesses in the last 10 years. So that's kind of a rough, about 10,000 people we work with. Right. And, you know, if you've never ventured in that area around 4th and Lake Street, uh, go there sometime. I mean, you, you may have the impression, too, that's all boarded up buildings, but go see the transformation that's happening. Uh, high school that's being built with some uh, um, help from Colin Paul. Mm-hmm. And uh, just some amazing things happen. When, when you go into dark places and just refuse to give up and say, you know, no, light can be shined here, things can begin to happen. Any particular stories that you have from that or that you wanted to share? Or? Um, I think that a great story, there's a lot of stories, um, and I guess this might not be a really emotional story, but, um, but it is emotional for us when you work with this day-to-day. Um, Ophelia came to us, well, I, I ran into Ophelia about, I'll start at the beginning and go back, about three weeks ago she popped into my office. I hadn't seen Ophelia for a long time. She's a, a sophomore at the U now, but... When Oph- before Ophelia came to us, she was in Sierra Leone. She was nine years old, and they dressed her up every single day as an old lady so she wouldn't be abducted and become a child soldier. So she lived that way, lost her parents, 
She came to us, did not know how to speak English, did not know anything. We worked with her for years. And now she's a sophomore at the U. And she popped in, she, and she just to share what's going on and, and stuff like that. And um, it's an amazing kind of thing when you just kind of stop for a second and just realize um, what has happened in her life. She should be dead right now. So that's, that's an example of what goes on kind of on a daily basis. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, questions, we're going to, you know, if you have questions, and please do send them back there. Because, I mean, obviously there's lots of questions about what Mark Peter does with his, with his organization and maybe how you could be involved. But more importantly, we're not trying to get you all signed up for Urban Ventures here. I mean, he thinks we are, but, and I let him think that, <laughs> inviting him. But what I want, I want you to just see an example of how they systematically, you know, by looking at kids, looking at their families, looking at economic structures, by looking at heads, hearts, hands, and I know I missed one. Hurt. Hurt. Um, you know, realizing where they could touch people's lives. Uh, as a large organization, they're able to do all these things very strategically, you know, one by one, add to them. Now, you know, you're one person or, you know, or two people or a family or maybe with your friends or maybe it's as, as a small group, a, you know, group at Jacob's Well, but to start thinking, well, how can I do this? Where would I begin to do that? Um, you know, so, you know, go ahead. If you, please get those questions back there and, you know, break the ice. We've got to um, feel free to do that. But where, where does this start fitting our individual lives? I mean, you know, I, I'm not as crazy as you. I'm not, you know, I haven't taken on that job. And um, how can I start making a difference in people's lives? Well, I mean, I think, like I said, I think you're the own, your own answer to your prayer. It, it begins, I think... Uh, well, sometimes, you know, it's easier to write a check that goes overseas than it is to walk across the street. Isn't that true when you think about it? And that's not a guilt thing. It's not a shame thing. It's just a reality thing. And so it really begins uh, around you. It doesn't necessarily begin at Phillips neighborhood or, or Central neighborhood. It begins um, on your block. It just begins becoming aware. It means are you willing to be involved, you know? And I think that when you look at it, we have three... Uh, R's that we talk about and the first R that we deal with is relocation and that means you know Jesus didn't just kind of like stay up in heaven and kind of like you know fix people he came and got dirty and he was willing to be involved in your life in my life okay so are you willing to relocate meaning are you willing to be present for somebody so that's one thing. I, I'm going to just jump in real fast because when I first heard this relocation I thought oh that's a good idea you mean you got some people in a tough area let's relocate them and then he kept talking, he said, oh, you're talking about me relocating. <laughs> and he said, ooh, you know, <laughs> ouch. Yeah, so there you go. Think about that one. That's all based on the incarnation, you know, that he became like us. Are you willing to become something for somebody else to make a difference? And then uh, redistribution? Ah, redistribution. I don't know, it's behind me. Uh, does it mean giving money to the poor? The, the fastest way to get money back into the hands of the rich is give it to the poor. It just goes. So what we want to do is, if you're an accountant, uh, teach budgeting to people. Uh, it doesn't matter what your profession is, what your ability is. That is redistribute the wealth of, of your experience. And then um, the last one is what? Reconciliation. Reconciliation, which obviously is if something has happened vertically, then something better be happen horizontally. You know, if you've made it right between you and God, then the proof of that is that you're making it right between, you know, people down the street and stuff. Yeah, and if it's not, then it's not real. Then the vertical thing isn't real. That's something we believe in real um, strongly here. I, I'm convinced that the more, the more and the more closely and the harder what we look at God, the more we see our neighbors. Yeah. And, you, you know, you can't, you can't have it any other way. Um, you know, one question that came up to me from, actually, I've been asked this probably at least once a week, and it's probably because of our location right here on 46, but what about the signers, you know, on the freeway? How many of you drive by a, you know, a guy with a cardboard sign on a freeway entrance periodically, and they're all, you know, desperate, need work, whatever, and, uh, and you don't know what to do? It, you know, should you give them something or not? And I think, and this is not to slam anybody who gives, you know, a dollar to the signer people, I think uh, there's a big difference between uh, charity and justice. If you start thinking about that. And you unpack that a little bit. Uh, sometimes giving a dollar to that person means more to us than it does to them. You know what I'm saying? It means more to us in f 
the fact that we are doing something, then it really means what they're going to do with that dollar. And that's something to think about. I think uh, what we are so conditioned at Urban Ventures is, is we think about outcomes. Okay? What really does that dollar go to producing that you can actually show behavioral change in a kid's life? So if you want to do charity, that's fine. You know, people, um, some people need that. But if you want to not, you do not have to not feel guilty if you don't give a dollar to a signer person and you want to invest your money into organizations that, well, I saw this thing in the bulletin about the $197 that the kids raised to go to, you know, clean water or, or the water that will, yeah, affect 197 kids in Africa. Now, that's an outcome. And personally, that's where I would invest my money because then I know where, it, where it's going. I know what it's doing. I know what it's producing. And that's not charity. That really is a form of justice. Justice is really seeking to make the playing field level for everybody. So by giving a dollar to a signer, not slamming the signers, is that making the playing field level? I don't know. Something to think about. Um, another question that... Oh, Rob's got one. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the, the, the high school, Cristo Rey High School, how is it different you know, from South High School? Is there going to be spiritual, religious components to it? Stuff like that. Um, the Jesuits are 450 years old, and this is the first time in their history that they've made an, a partnership with an, a, a, an organization that's not Jesuit. So it's kind of a big deal for them. It's a big deal for us as well. Um, the, the big thing about Cristo Rey is one, it's, it's kind of like giving a private school experience like a Cretan Durham Hall to a poor kid. So that's justice. That's leveling the play. Why can't a kid who really is motivated and whose parents work in three or four jobs just you know, survive, why couldn't that kid go to Benil or to a Breck or you know, something like that? So we're doing that for them. So it will be um, highly academic. Uh, they go to school four days a week. On the fifth day, they actually work in a downtown location. They'll, they'll work in a law firm, they'll work at Deloitte & Touche, they'll work, it's not like going to McDonald's to work, but they actually are uh, involved in a corporate setting, so they kind of get used to that and exposed to that. Chapel um, is provided, it's not mandatory. Um, they, uh, it is, it is uh, spiritual, you know, but it's not something that uh, is a requirement that they're gonna really hammer away on kids. And it's going to be small, 125 kids per class, 500 kids. Go ahead, Darren. Why isn't this? Yeah, why isn't that kind of uh, promotional ideas happening in public schools? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> You elect them to the school board. Uh, yeah, we really work a lot with public schools, with Minneapolis Public, with, with Green Central, you know, all the schools in our neighborhood. Um, uh, Minneapolis Public really knows what we're doing with Cristo Rey. They're supporters of this. They don't see this as being a, you know, if you think about it, they took out Central High School. That was our high school. So really, when you think of that neighborhood, there's no high school until you get to South or until you get to North or you to get to Washburn. So it's this huge kind of hole. And when they took Central out, a school is always kind of this, the soul of the community, small s, isn't it? So, you know, there was, there, was, there was football games, there was homecoming, all that stuff is gone. So I think um, what we're trying to do, which is a big, big leap, you know, for, for a huge Minneapolis public, is to really try to bring community back into school. And that's a, it's a great concept, and I think we'll, we'll achieve it. But sometimes you have to go smaller to achieve that. I'm going to um, jump here to the screen, and uh, the one, how can I get a job at Urban Ventures? Talk to Mark Peter afterwards here. I'll, I'll make him hang around for a little while. Um, the, the top one, what, what if I can't feel hope right now? And, um, you know, you might have something to say to that. Let me speak to that, too. And, you know, I, hope is believing, trusting, living as if something is true that we can't see. And when you are in the darkness, you aren't the person to see it. 
That's why we are a community. That's why it, it's a difference between having a relationship with God and being part of a community that is in relationship to God. Because when you can't see the dark, when you can't see the light, then you need me beside you to see the light for you and point you to it. And, and hold, on, hold your hand until you can see it again. And likewise, when I'm in the dark, I need you to do that for me. And it isn't a, you know, a one or the other for any of us. All of us have light and darkness, and we all have to be together. We all have to help each other see it. When I have no idea how to be the light you know, in a dark place, you know, then I've got you know, Mark Peters. Said, well, Greg, these are ways that I could help you be effective. This is a way I can help you um, not only see light, but you know, show light to other people. Um, it, it, you know, that, that's where I go from. But, but you know, how can you see it? I don't know. Um, uh, if you don't feel you know, like you're in that light right now, you know, this is a time to gather with, with people. Um, I don't know where you will find it, but you're gonna. But don't try to find it all by yourself. I think there's different faces of poverty, and I think that person, um, you might be in a place that we'd call spiritual poverty. You know, it's not poverty is not always just bloated bellies and flies, you know, going around your eyes. You have to look for poverty as it presents itself to you, and to to us, spiritual poverty uh, equals a lack of hope. A lack of hope a lot of times leads to a lack of conscience meaning you just don't give a damn anymore. You just go and get hammered or, or whatever. So you really have to kind of back off from that. And, and how do you address the spiritual poverty in your life? And sometimes it's not by receiving, but it's by giving. Sometimes it's about being involved in someone's life. It's about giving back. So, you know what I'm saying? It's not always um, going to a Bible study or, or having people pray for you or, or stuff like that. Sometimes it's just saying, Lord, I'm, I'll be available. I'm a mess. I'm crippled. I'm empty. You know, I don't know how in the heck you're going to use a person like me, but uh, I'm willing. And sometimes you begin to get filled up. Yeah, I want to think there's a lot more questions. and I know we're probably just beginning to tap it. And this is our first time to try to do this. So we're sort of working it all out and we'll be a little bit better at it next week. But I'm sure Mark P. will be around afterwards to talk to some of you. And um, you can certainly contact him at Urban Ventures. The phone number is on their website, urbanventures.org. Um, but I do have a couple of uh, presents for you. First of all, these very highly esteemed um, Jacob's Well t-shirts. These are hard to come by. It is, we, we do give one to every, we force every first time visitor to take one. <laughs> I happen to know that after he decided to speak with us, he went outside and his next door neighbor came out with one on. So a good trend. And then in the tradition of... Um, uh, the National Press Club. We have a, a Jacob's Well a mug. mug. Yeah, don't turn on the side where it says Bethlehem Lutheran Church crossed out. But I wrote Jacob's Well on this side. Very beautiful. Thank you. So, thank you very much. All right. Let's let's just pray for a second. Dear Lord, um, you know we just begin to tap this and start thinking about what it means that we live in a world where darkness seems to cover things over, but yet we need to believe in light, and we need to be light, and we need to seek light, and how that happens, how we can be it for others, how we can find it for ourselves is so difficult. And we thank you that you have given us people that are spending their lives that can show the way and we can follow. We thank you for giving us a community that can be with us and support us in doing that. Uh, open our hearts and help us to see how we can be your light for others and how we can receive your light within us. And um, help us enjoy this song that reminds us so much of the light you have to give us. Yeah. 
I think the offering bags pretty much went across. If yours didn't go on your aisle or on that side, and you can pass it off. But what I what I would like us to do is as we go, um, you know, so that worship isn't just something we come and do for uh, an hour and fifteen minutes on Sunday morning, but it's something that's part of our week. Is I'd like you to think about how can you be light this week, and I'd like you to think of one very specific thing. This is a way I could be light in a tangible, concrete, measurable way, and I'm going to work on being it all week long. And it might be something very simple. I mean, uh, one that I took on a while ago was every time I go to a checkout counter, a cashier, you know, a movie store, or a gas station, a grocery store, whatever, I make sure I make eye contact with the checkout person. And I'll, I address them, look them in the eye, and just kind of coax a smile back from them. And just thinking that at least I won't be one of those customers that they go, you know, that makes their day longer. You know, hopefully, I just want to be a, a customer that made their day a little bit shorter. Just a very, very little thing like that. It might be something bigger. You might decide to be a, you know, a, a parent in a, a, in a, you know, at a school one hour a week or something like that. But find something. Think of something that you can shine some light. Now, you all know the old expression of being, you know, the random act of kindness. And let's be, let's all find ways that we can commit our systematic acts of light shining. All right? And try it out this week. And if you're in a group that starts meeting, uh, this is a great place to talk about. What did you pick out? How did you try it? You know, how did it work? And explore that with, with um, you know, one another and see how those experiments work. That's where God asks us to start. And I think you'll find as you try one thing out, you're going to discover more and more that are ready for you. Um, we have many thoughts and prayers that I know are within us right now, people that we're concerned about, uh, people that we want to hold up in prayer. I invite you to remember those people. We'll have uh, a moment of silence before we leave and um, to hold those prayers up to God and knowing that God is going to be faithful. And as Mark Peter said, how is God using me? How is God calling on me to be the answer to the prayer that I've just shared? Let's just take a moment of silence. Lord, the silence is difficult. Um, it draws in all kinds of things. It draws in truth. It draws in fear. It draws in wonder. It draws our minds towards distractions. Um, but you are with us there. We ask that you be with each and every one of us in the thoughts and the concerns, the hopes and the dreams and the thanks that we shared within ourselves and the ones that maybe are so buried so deeply that they didn't even quite come out, but we know that you heard them. Be with us now. We've got big weeks ahead of us. Help us to be your servants. Help us to shine light in all those corners of our, li our own lives and the world around us. And help us to believe, hold on to the truth that this is the world that you have created, the world that you have finished, that you have completed. And let us live as it is so. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, go in peace. We will see you back next week. Um, first time visitors, if you, uh, we got a uh, welcome table back here you can get a t-shirt you know not let mark peter be the only one and uh, if anybody wants to stick around and help with some tear down we won't chase you away thanks much we'll see you next week